I've been dispatched to a 70 year old male who's collapsed following an acute onset of central crushing chest pain. The patient has a previous history of MI five years ago and states that this time the pain feels different. The patient presents clammy, cool peripherally, his eyes are open to voice and he's unable to obey commands. I've given him a GCS score of 10 made up of 3, 2 and 5. The patient complained of palpitations before his collapse and has strong carotid pulses. The patient takes salazapril and aspirin. I've deemed this patient to be status 1 and I've called for backup for an R50. I've taken a 12 lead ECG from the patient to confirm my diagnosis of unconscious VT due to significant cardiovascular compromise. Thus I've ruled out my differential diagnoses of SVT with aberrancy and hyperkalemia. I've taken a full set of vital signs from the patient, giving me a heart rate of 170, a blood pressure of 70 over 40, a rest rate of 18, a blood glucose level of 7.6 and a temperature of 37 degrees. Because of the patient's level of consciousness, he needs to be sedated before I cardiovert him. I've called the clinical desk for guidance on sedation with ketamine. I've drawn up 100 milligrams of ketamine and diluted it with 9 mils of sodium chloride. This gives me a solution containing 10 milligrams of ketamine per 1 mil. I've drug checked the ketamine and the sodium chloride flush with my crew partner and applied a medication added sticker. Because the patient weighs 70 kilos, I'm going to administer 35 milligrams of ketamine, that is 3.5 mils. I'm oxygenating the patient with 15 liters per minute via a non rebreather mask. I have a manual ventilation bag and mask at hand for if required. Throughout the process, my crew partner will be continually monitoring the patient's breathing, SpO2 and level of consciousness. Before cardioversion, I'm going to assess the patient's level of consciousness one final time. Hello sir, can you hear me? He's got no response to pain or voice, but if he did, I would administer a second dose of ketamine. To mitigate the risks of cardioversion, I need to use the checklist on page 127 of the pocket CPGs. So using this checklist, I have my pads in the apex sternum position on the patient, my defibrillator is in manual mode, sent to 200 joules. I've selected the lead with the tallest visible R wave and the clearest complexes. I'm going to select synchronized mode and ensure there's a detection symbol above every QRS. I'm going to reconfirm that the patient doesn't need any further sedation. Hello sir, can you hear me? He's got no response to pain or voice stimuli. I've selected the joules, 200. I'm going to charge the defibrillator and make sure everyone's clear from the patient. Okay, shocking now, everyone clear. I'm going to press and hold the shock button until the shock is delivered. Okay, the shock's been delivered. I'm going to determine the, ryth determine the rhythm now, which appears to uh, have returned to some sort of sinus rhythm. The sinus tachycardia at 124. I'm going to reassess the patient's level of consciousness. Hello sir, can you hear me? Can you hear me sir? Yeah, I can hear you. And the patient appears to have an improved GCS. I'm not going to cardiovert the patient again because he's returned to a normal sinus rhythm. I've been dispatched to a 40 year old male who was water blasting his roof when he slipped and fell approximately 6 metres onto his concrete driveway. His elderly neighbour witnessed the fall and said he fell onto the back of his head. He has no past medical history. Upon examination, I've found a six centimetre boggy mass to the back of the head. The patient has a GCS of six, made up of two for eyes as he's responsive to pain, two for verbal because he's moaning and groaning, and three for motor because he's extending his limbs upon painful stimuli. The patient's vital signs are as follows. Heart rate 50, blood pressure 160 over 90, rest rate 12 and irregular, blood glucose level 7.6, and a temperature of 37 degrees. Because of his decreased level of consciousness and history of head injury, I've called for an R50 backup for RSI. The backup crew are 10 minutes away and have instructed me to carry out the RSI preparation checklist in the CPGs. Whilst waiting for my backup to arrive, I'm going to treat the patient for his TBI. I've immobilised his head and neck due to the risk of ceasefire injury from the mechanism of the fall. He's maintaining his own airway, but I have airway adjuncts available in case I need to take over manual ventilation. 
I also have a manual ventilation bag and mask with heat set to 5 centimetres of water as indicated in the setting of PDI. I'm oxygenating the patient with 10 litres per minute via a reservoir mask. I have monitoring equipment attached, including ECG leads, a non-invasive blood pressure and an SpO2. I place bilateral IVs in the patient and set up a saline administration set. I've also drawn up 10 milligrams of morphine, which I've drug checked with my partner for in case the patient becomes combative. While waiting for my backup to arrive, I'm going to run through the RSI checklist on page 131. I've attached nasal prongs to the patient without oxygen. I'm pre-oxygenating using a reservoir mask set to 10 litres per minute. I've attached an ECG, a non-invasive blood pressure and an SpO2 probe, and I've prepared capnography. I've positioned the monitor so it can be seen easily, particularly by the RSI officer, and I've lifted the space to the right of the patient free for the intubation equipment. I've gained bilateral IV access, and I've prepared a running line of sodium chloride, which has been drug checked. I've positioned the patient for optimal airway control, and I've maintained his C-spine throughout this. I've placed the Thomas tube holder under the patient's neck, so it's ready to go. I've checked the suction unit is working, and it's turned off to the side of the patient. I've prepared a manual ventilation bag with a peak valve attached and set to five centimeters of water. I've obtained a set of vital signs, which are ready for the RSI officer when he arrives. I've also updated the backup on the patient's condition with his vital signs. There's clear access to the side of the patient and the head of the patient, ready for RSI. ICPs may only attempt endotracheal intubation twice. They must then revert to airway control using an OPA or LMA. They may require assistance from you, including backwards, upwards, rightwards pressure of the trachea, or assistance with the bougie, which is used to find anatomical landmarks of the airway. This involves feeding the tube over the bougie. The ICP may opt for a cricothyrotomy, which is an incision into the trachea via the cricoid membrane.